Okay, um, so today we're combining BMPs and certification into one lecture. And you know these are broad topics that you cover in other courses. Um, you certainly get into best management practices a lot in hydrology, but also in management plans and other courses. So I just wanna cover it pretty briefly today and look at how BMPs are really gonna interact with silviculture. And some of this we've already discussed on, on various labs this semester. And then certification will impact all sorts of different things. You get into this, I know in wood tech, um, where it's influencing the product stream and it's influencing what wood mills can buy and how mills uh, will track uh, all their wood. Uh, so I just want to get into a, a brief overview on how certification works and how it may impact some of your civil cultural prescription writing. Um, and then go over a few other sort of regulatory factors that you may need to consider that we really haven't talked about elsewhere. And so with BMPs, um, I don't know if that link still works, just Google Texas Forestry BMPs and you'll get the free PDF. They probably have apps now, right? So um, all this information is freely available online. Um, I used to give you all a little spiral bound uh, book, TFS would give me those, but the, the person who was doing that retired. Um, but it's, you know, 100, 200 page manual. And as you start flipping through it, uh, you really just notice it's a lot about roads. Um, there's, there's all sorts of things in there, but a lot of it is going to be focused on roads. So um, best management practices have been developed at the state level. And so what you see in Texas will be similar, but a little bit different than what you see in the other southern states. And then as you go to other regions, it varies a little bit more. And the whole idea behind BMPs, they're voluntary in most states. And the idea is that if we can show good voluntary compliance, with these management practices. If we can document that we're doing a good job because you know we know what we're doing, our loggers know what they're, what they're doing, the foresters and the loggers work well together, the foresters know what they're doing, and it's being successful for landowners, it's managing sustainably, and most importantly, it's not putting sediment into streams, then there will be no need for state and federal governments to put a bunch of regulations on the forest products industry. And so it's, it, they were created in response to the Clean Water Act and they've really been a, a pretty good success story. Um, there's a lot of data out there showing that BMPs are effective, that they do keep sediment out of streams, they keep nutrients out of streams, they keep herbicide out of streams. And we haven't seen broad scale federal regulations come down where loggers would have to start getting permits to put in forest roads, permits to put in log decks, uh, permits to go do different harvest operations. So it's been pretty effective. Um, there have been some recent court cases out West uh, where they're trying to argue that a log deck or a log road is a point source of pollution rather than a non-point source of pollution, which would therefore require a permit. Uh, but thus far, those court cases have not been successful. So we'll, we'll see how that, that goes. It's, it's an ongoing process. But. And so, you know, just briefly on BMPs, you're trying to affect three basic things. If we can prevent that sediment grain from detaching from the soil, it can erode. If we can minimize how it moves, that's gonna make it less likely to get into a stream. And if we can get it to deposit somewhere before the stream, that, that's also gonna keep it out of the stream. So, so here's a couple different examples of BMPs intended to minimize detachment. So what do you see in that photo on the left that's gonna keep soil from detaching from that road? Yeah, just gravel. That, that's why we put gravel and rock on a road. If a droplet of water hits a pile of sand, it can move a grain of sand. If a droplet of water hits a piece of gravel, the gravel doesn't move. And so larger particles, less likely to erode. And then what do you see them doing on the right there to prevent erosion on that road? Yeah, they're applying seed. So if we can revegetate and close out roads, that'll help us minimize erosion. A whole lot of this BMP manual you'll see is gonna be focused on things that prevent the transport of sediment. And so these are all these different structures that we'll see on our roads that will get water off the road. Because the longer water moves down a road and the faster it moves down the road, the more potential it has to erode that road. Whereas if you can move it off to the side into a vegetated area, it's gonna slow down, lose energy and not be able to cause a whole lot of erosion. So we'll get into these a little bit more in a minute here. And then we try to get our sediment to deposit. So on the upper left, this isn't something you too commonly see in forestry, 
but you'll see this on construction jobs in urban areas all the time. That's called a silt fence. And so they put a silt fence up around a construction site so that it'll catch any runoff, any you know, runoff that is carrying sediment, the sediment will deposit there and it doesn't make it to the stream. Well, we, we have a much simpler version of a silt fence that you don't even have to install. What do we keep near our streams? Trees, trees right? We have streamside management zones, which is just trees basically serving as our silt fence for us. Um, and so all the research out there basically shows SMZs are effective. You know, even if we made them more narrow than our current 50 foot width, um, even if we got them down to a really low basal area, they're still pretty effective. So they tend to work pretty well. And then we've gone over this already when we talked about clear cutting, but the actual harvest of trees is gonna be a minor impact compared to roads. So we looked at that data out of Coweta where they thought, oh, if we clear cut the watershed in this mountainous area, clear down to the creeks, that's gonna cause all the erosion. But no, it was the road building that seemed to cause great issues. And so as you look at implementing BMPs, um, as a forester, if you go to work for a big company, and so you're out meeting with loggers who are contracting with your company, um, a lot of what you'll be doing with them is gonna be pre-harvest planning and post-harvest inspection. So that's what a major part of your job becomes. And so with that pre-harvest planning, uh, all these large companies now have, you know, complex GIS systems. And so they'll print you all sorts of different maps. Some of them will pertain to erosion, rutting, other risks, depending on the soils, but it'll also have the streams on there. And so you can work with the logger to do pre-harvest planning, get the logger good maps of the property, um, make sure they know where the decks and skid trails and roads um, need to go and in particular the areas they need to avoid. And then, you know, when you start doing all this pre-harvest planning, what they found and the, these studies are out of Virginia, um, so a little more mountainous terrain than we have here, but they found that pre-harvest training resulted in two major changes. And this was training with the loggers. Um, they started using topo maps more and topo maps in steeper areas make a big deal with how you put roads in, right? Um, if you put a road in the wrong place, it will just erode, erode, erode. You've created a long-term expensive problem. If you put a road in the correct place, it's much cheaper to maintain, maybe safer to work on, and it keeps all the sediment out of the stream. The other thing that's you know, gonna kind of be a theme here is where does a road have the greatest potential to put sediment into a stream? Where it crosses the stream, right? That's common sense. Where the road crosses the stream, that's where it's got the greatest potential to put the most sediment in the stream. So what they found was planning for those stream crossings in particular is gonna be important. So you're planning for them in a few different ways. You're planning the operation using these maps such that you minimize stream crossings. Maybe you have a log deck on this side of the stream and then another log deck on the other side of the stream and you don't have to cross it very often at all. Um, or you know, if you are gonna to have to cross it, once is better than two or three or four times. So put in as few crossings as possible, put them straight across the stream, 90 degrees across the stream. So they're taking up as little area on the banks as possible to minimize erosion there. And then that table at the bottom is some data that came out of this pre-harvest training. And we have this in Texas. Uh, our Texas Forestry Association um, has different logger training programs and the loggers can get certified. They can get continuing education credits. Uh, our Texas Forestry Association gives out a, you know, Texas Logger of the Year Award. So th there's a lot of, you know, sort of professional pride around this, but it, it really works well. So the trained group implemented BMPs a little better than the control group, the untrained group, but they did a pretty good job too, 86%. Um, the landowners were a little bit happier. So you can sell this to the landowners. You're going to get a better harvest job out of a logger who's trained. And then you can sell it to the loggers too. So logging is a high volume, low margin business. You have to move a lot of wood all the time because you're making just a little bit of money on each load. And so if they have downtime due to weather, that makes it harder and harder for them to make a profit. Well, they had basically eight days, so over a week less downtime per year due to weather when they did pre-harvest planning. And it was because the road network was better. There were fewer streams. And so as it started getting wetter, they were still able to operate. Whereas if they put the roads in the wrong places, they would have had to shut the job down sooner. So 
So you can sell it to the landowner, you can sell it to, you know, regulators, you can sell it to foresters, you can sell it to the loggers. So, you know, there's a lot of benefits to everybody uh, to get this right. So as we look at roads now and, you know, some of these different structures, you may be familiar with some of them. You've probably seen most of them, whether you knew it or not, you've driven over them. Sometimes these are pretty inconspicuous, right? And so we'll, we'll look at some of these different structures here. One thing you can control is the road template. Um, if you're putting in a new road, if, if you're not, it's pretty much set, right? If you're working on an existing road network. And so the, the very bottom there, the through fill, that's the tram road lab at Dendro, right? Where you're driving on that raised road in a bottom land. Um, that's a pretty stable way to put a road in. The downside is it's basically a long, low dam. And so you may see changes in the hydrology where it'll raise the water table on one side, lower it on the other side. And then all of a sudden you get trees dying on one or both sides of the road because you've either flooded them or you've dried them out. So um, it, it's not perfect, but we see it commonly in bottomland areas. Um, the through cut, we don't often see much around here. You'll see that in mountainous areas where basically you have these long narrow valleys and it's usually road stream. So the roads are parallel and right beside the stream because that's about the only place to put them. So that's something you'll commonly see. Um, and then the other three are the idea that you put the road along the contour line. So it's running along the contour line. So it's sort of in a mid slope position. So you could do a totally flat template, the full bench. That's not very common because water's just gonna pond up on it. It's gonna cause problems. So what we tend to see is one of the top two options, the side hill cut or the outslope cut. And so the advantage of the outslope cut is water just runs off it, okay? So water runs downhill, it's outslope, so it's sloped downhill. It's very simple. Water comes down the slope, gets onto the road, rolls over the road and keeps going down the slope. The inslope template, the water hits the road and the road is slanted back up slope. So it has to roll into a ditch there. And then that's gonna be running down the hill in that ditch and so eventually you have to put in some sort of structure that's gonna move water out of that ditch and back to the downhill side of the road. So it's gonna take time and effort and money to put in culverts underneath the road or other structures to get that water back across the road. And so, you know, if you looked at that from just a common sense standpoint, you know, go with outslope, right? It's cheaper, but here's what you have to think about too. So if you're up in the mountains on Dr. Kidd's hardwood silviculture field tour, and Sally's driving and you've already seen her put one tire up in the air and you know you're on some really steep terrain so if the van goes off the road you know you're in trouble which would you rather be on outsloped or insloped if you get into wet weather icy weather snow and your vehicle starts sliding on an insloped road it's likely to go into that ditch maybe you do a little damage to the vehicle but nobody dies and so that in-slope template is safer to operate on because if you lose control of the vehicle, you probably don't go down the mountain, you just hit into the uphill side. So, so that's why it's favored often, even though it is more expensive because you have to put all those culverts in. So. Um, here's a water bar on a skid trail. This is basically just a speed bump you make out of dirt. And so the common misconception around water bars is this could be a permanent structure. They're not, these are temporary structures you would put on a skid trail as you're trying to close it out because it's just, you know, it's a mound of dirt. So if you keep driving over it and over and over it, it's eventually gonna break down and then, you know, it's just not gonna be effective. But it's straight across the road. So the water runs down it, hits it, and it's moved off to the side. Uh, rolling dips or broad base dips are two different control structures intended to make it so you don't need a culvert. So basically what you have is you have that in-sloped road template. So you've got the ditch on the uphill side of the road. And then at some point along there, you just put in an outslope section that's down in a dip. And so that outslope section gets water back across your road. You don't have to pay for a culvert. Culverts are expensive. Culvert's just a big pipe, metal, cement, plastic, but it's just a big pipe and they tend to be pretty costly. Um, the downside to that is imagine driving through that rolling dip with a log truck fully loaded, you know, it's not ideal for log trucks. These are intended more just for, you know, smaller vehicles. Typically, um, I guarantee you Alejandro could get at least two tires off the ground going through that rolling dip there. So 
um, you, you got to go through them kind of slow. So that's the downside to them. Sometimes you'll see broad-based dips. It's the same idea, but it's just elongated, stretched out with less topographic relief. And so that's more suitable to a long trip. You have all sorts of different water turnouts where you have these different structures where you get water off the road. And if you're ever driving around in mountainous areas, you'll see culverts just sticking, you know, way out the side of the downhill side of the road. And you have to think about what happens when the water gets off the road. Because if you put that water just off to the side out of a dip or out of a culvert and it falls five feet, then hits the ground, it's going to start causing erosion there. And it'll eventually erode back into your road. The culvert will fall out and the road will become impassable. So you need to put brush there, rock, something else um, in order to prevent erosion from coming back into your road. So here's an example of culvert installation. Uh, we could probably go up or Gay Street here and see an example of this, right? They're doing all that uh, road work up there. Um, so it's just a pipe under the road. That's all it is. The advantage of culverts is that if you bury them deep enough, it's not a bridge. It's not anything structural. You don't really need to get an engineer involved. And so that's the advantage of them. They're simple. They do require maintenance. They'll, they'll fill up. You've got to clean them out. Um, they'll get crushed sometimes. You've got to replace them. So they're certainly not maintenance free. Um, the other thing you'll see around here sometimes, those two photos on the right look like many areas around here where we'll have ditches running beside the road in relatively flat topography. Ditches will sediment in and you have to send someone out there to dig them back to their original depth. But remember, it's illegal under the Clean Water Act to dig them deeper if they had formerly drained a wetland. So one thing you see sometimes is called daylighting a road. And this is pretty much just cut the trees around the road. It's the opposite of an aesthetic management zone. So around here, what that'll do is that'll dry your road out faster so that it's operable sooner. Um, if you go further north, what that does is that'll melt snow and ice more quickly um, so that the road becomes trafficable again. What they really tend to find um, with BMPs and roads is that if you can close the road after a harvest operation, that that will help with a lot of these issues. That'll help with a lot of the erosion. Revegetate it, close it, and you're in good shape. Here's the problem with that. Um, they did a study in West Virginia and basically found that the harvest areas, one to eight years post harvest, they were fine. They were revegetated, not much erosion at all. But the log roads and skid trails were still a major source of erosion. And it's because even though the logging job was done, just because you put a gate up doesn't mean you're keeping people out, right? And so they had a lot of off road vehicles uh, back in there. When I was at Virginia Tech, we went out, they had just put in a new gate and they'd had issues with this gate. So they'd even taken the steel pipe and filled it with cement. And we went out there like a month after they'd done this and it was already halfway cut through. So I guess they got out there and they either ran out of beer or they ran out of grinding wheels or something. Uh, but they called it quits for the day. I'm sure they were coming back. So uh, actually being able to close them and keep people out is gonna be a real challenge. Um, we're fortunate in this part of the world uh, where we have um, this strong infrastructure of hunting leases. And so that really does help us where the, the lessees will help the big companies, um, you know, know who's out on the land, whether they should be there or not. Um, and so that, that can help with access in our area. Warehouser up in Arkansas, um, they bought some land up there, Arkansas and Oklahoma, and the land had been open to hunting for decades. And eventually people started doing enough dumb stuff that Weyerhaeuser felt they had to close the land. So they gated it all off. And then they started running into big problems of, you know, people going around and pulling out Weyerhaeuser gates. The other big problem they ran into was arson. People were just going out and setting the woods on fire because they were upset. And so the arson seems to have tapered off a little bit over time, but they, they found kind of a clever human dimension solution to the gate issue. What they did is they quit putting in Weyerhaeuser gates they started having the people that lease the land for hunting buy warehouser standard gates from them as part of the hunting lease. And so at that point, you weren't out there pulling out a big company gate, you were out there pulling out your neighbor's gate. And so that cut down on a lot of the damage they were seeing on the gates. So kind of a clever solution there. Again, with stream crossings, uh, that's where you have that greatest potential to get water into the stream. And so here you've got a photo of a culvert crossing on the bottom, a small bridge on the top there. Uh, which do you think has more potential to put sediment in the stream, the culvert crossing or the bridge? 
bridge, you know, most people often think bridge, but you know, some of this BMP stuff, it's so obvious, it's just easy to overlook it. When you put in a culvert, you literally use a bulldozer to push dirt into the creek around the culvert, right? So look at that culvert, they, they pile dirt around it in the creek. Um, so culverts actually tend to cause a little more sediment into the, the stream. Um, you know, you might think it would be the bridge just with the approach and everything, but it tends to be those culvert crossings. Um, stream crossings are expensive. And so people have come up with all sorts of uh, low cost options out there. You know, so culverts are one low cost option because you don't need that engineer involved. Um, people will throw all sorts of material into streams to form temporary crossings. So you might see crane mats in our part of the world put into a stream or over a stream where they can even drive across some, on some equipment if the crane mat is substantial enough. Um, a few years ago when they were up, updating our uh, power lines around here uh, near the loop throughout town, we saw a bunch of those crane mats uh, down on the power line right away when the power company was doing that. Um, so power, uh, crane mat is just a really big, really heavy duty pallet. Uh, some of them are big enough that you could actually set it down and use it as a bridge on a small stream. So, um, so you can just drive through the creek. You may want to put some reinforcement in there. Um, they've come up with, you know, different skitter bridges that some loggers may own, which is a temporary bridge that they move from job to job. Um, and then some loggers will get creative and just throw a piece of drill pipe in the creek, throw some pulpwood in the creek, and then you drive over that. Um, and then you pull it all out at the end of the job. So and often for small creeks around here, they just drive right through them, just an unreinforced ford. So the other thing we've realized with BMPs, it's not just the stream crossing itself, but it is the approach of the road to the stream that really matters and can make a huge difference. If you have a steep, long straightaway leading right down to a stream crossing and the water's moving down that at high speed and you're not getting the water off the road, that can put a lot of sediment into a stream. And so getting not just the stream crossing right, but the approach to the stream crossing right and all these road BMPs correct there can make a pretty big difference. So that's just a brief synopsis on roads. But if you go look at the BMP manual, there is a ton more detail on all of these. Lots of drawings, pictures and whatnot. So SMZs are a big deal. We've been talking about them all semester. You all are probably pretty comfortable with SMZs at this point. Um, just keep in mind, we have different categories of streams. We have perennial, intermittent, and ephemeral streams. Uh, perennial and intermittent streams are the only streams that Texas BMPs require SMZs on. And so those are streams that are going to be flowing greater than 30% of the year. The other thing you have to keep in mind is all the, these are voluntary minimums. So there's absolutely no reason you can't put an SMZ on an ephemeral stream. It's just not required by BMPs. And again, BMPs are not required in most situations. Um, you want it 50 foot on each side of the stream bank. It used to be 50% cover, but that's hard to tell once you've logged some because 50% of what? Um, so they changed it to 50% or 50 square feet per acre basal area because that's easier to estimate. So, so that's the 50 and 50 rule, 50 feet, 50 square feet. If you're on steep terrain or a soil that you think has high potential for erosion, there's no reason you can't increase both those numbers. There's no reason you can't leave that SMZ on an ephemeral stream. So with a lot of these large company lands, their SMZs will take up about 13% of their tree fall. So if you make them wider, you know, across half a million acres, that adds up to a lot of acres. So that's sort of the trade off you're playing with there. And then there's really BMPs for all sorts of other things. Basically all the civil culture treatments we've talked about all semester have BMPs. There just aren't quite as many of them as you'll see on roads. Um, fire, obviously, in the case of wildland firefighting, if you've got a wildfire that's being, you know, they're trying to contain, that probably takes precedence over BMPs, right, as they push in dozer lines to contain it. But after the fire's contained, then those dozer lines basically may be functioning like a road for at least a little while. So you do have to think about, you know, what you need to go do to those dozer lines after the fact. If, if you are setting up a stand and can put those, you know, fire lines in place as you set up that stand, you can be thinking about that when it's not an emergency and you might be able to put them in places where they're less likely to cause erosion. You saw in the reading, there were lots of different, you know, harvest systems. And so there's lots of different variations of harvesting equipment that will have different pros and cons. A uh, number of folks on the reading questions were asking things about helicopter logging and 
you know, I've, I've never heard of or seen that here in East Texas. Um, I've heard of a municipality in North Carolina that was doing it because they were managing um, steep terrain solely really for watershed. It was providing high quality water the, to the municipality. And so that's why it made sense to spend the money on helicopter logging. They were probably losing money on the whole operation, but it got them the timber harvest they needed with, you know, no or almost no impact on the soil. I've seen helicopter logging done in Alaska, Southeast Alaska, where they can harvest high value timber, you know, so large Western red cedar, for example, drop it right in the Pacific Ocean, raft them together and get them to a mill that's right there on the ocean. Um, and so they're only transporting them short distances and they're high value trees, so it makes it worthwhile there. And it's really steep terrain. It would be difficult to log any other way. So um, someone asked on the reading question, questions if they're still rafting logs where you put all these logs in the rivers and you run them down the rivers. Um, they used to do a lot of that. The, the last log drive was up in Maine in like 1976. It became illegal under the Clean Water Act to do that. Um, often they would cause these log jams and often to get the logs down the stream, they would build temporary dams, get the water level up real high, have all the logs floating in them, then they would blow out the dams. And that, that quick flood is what would carry all the logs down. So, yeah. But if you look at the Sylvan's website, I've got some videos up of them doing that. That's where our Burling event came from, was people riding those log trains. So again, everything we've talked about, thinning, fertilizer, timber stand improvements, road maintenance, pesticide applications, you know, if, if it's a civil cultural treatment, there's a BMP for it. When you get into wetlands, things get a little more constrained. Um, and so there is a civil cultural exemption in the Clean Water Act. So basically, if you're following normal voluntary state BMPs, if you're doing normal civil cultural operations, and pretty much everything we've learned all semester is a normal civil cultural operation, and you're not doing things that are causing major alterations of hydrology, you're not applying pesticides off label, which would be illegal anyway, um, you know, you're gonna be under that civil cultural exemption in the Clean Water Act. If you are trying to convert bottomlands to pine plantations, you may need a permit for that if you're in some sort of designated wetland. But the simpler answer to that is, that's not a pine plantation site. So you probably shouldn't be trying to put a pine plantation in there anyway, because you're gonna have probably some significant mortality issues. It's just not a pine site, so. And BMPs are a big success story. You know, everyone seems pretty happy with them. Um, by and large, loggers don't seem to mind doing them too much. It works well for foresters. Um, it's sort of good public relations for forestry. And, you know, most importantly, you know, we don't have to go out and fill out permits every time you wanna, you know, Put in a log deck or put in a skid trail or something like that so it keeps our logging efficient it keeps our logging cheap so and uh, i won't go over this in detail but you can look at that uh, when i post these slides uh, but this is sort of the whole process you might go through as a forester um, as you go through a harvesting operation what you might be doing as the forester to help the logger with uh, implementing BMPs. so any questions on bmps Okay, let's shift gears to our next major topic, which is forest certification. So globally, there are a number of different certification systems. Uh, two of the biggest are FSC, the Forest Stewardship Council, and SFI, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. FSC is global. SFI only applies to North America. And so companies that have land outside of North America, SFI is not an option for those lands. FSC standards will vary, you know, country to country, region to region. Um, SFI standards, because they're only applied to North America, are, are going to be more uniform, less geographic extent there. Um, and certifications got, you know, you know, expanded more and more uh, since the mid '90s. To the point now, there's other organizations like uh, I think it's uh, EPA or yeah, I forget what it's called, but they actually have umbrella organizations now that basically certify the certification organizations. Um, to sort of endorse the ones that are best in each area. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of different options on certification these days. Uh, so out of date by about a decade, but um, these numbers show FSC with about 120 million acres in North America, SFI with about 193 million acres of certified forest in North America. Um, the third system we'll talk about today is tree farm. 
And so tree farm is more targeted towards small non-industrial private forest landowners. It's actually the oldest of any of these. Um, but SFI recognizes tree farm and the Canadian standards, which is kind of their equivalent of tree farm. And so that would bring the SFI total up to 383 million acres in North America. So SFI is most common here in the South. There is some FSC certification. So I just wanted to go over SFI here for you briefly, just to give you sort of an idea of the process and then look at a few of the key points that'll actually impact directly what you may be doing on prescriptions. And so with SFI, you, you can Google them, go to their website, and they describe all this in detail there. They have PDFs up with their standards and application procedures and everything. But basically, you'll submit an application to become SFI certified. Um, and they've got different pathways for this. If you're a mill, you can submit an application on that side of things. Um, if you're a land manager with land that you're managing, you can submit an application on that side of things. So they have, they have different aspects you can focus on. Um, and then SFI themselves is not going to come out and make sure you're doing everything correctly. Uh, they send, or they don't even send, you contract with a third party um, auditor. So SFI trains and approves the auditors. The auditors are independent from SFI. They go out and uh, they will inspect your property and everything you're doing and make sure you're up to SFI standards. So you actually implement those standards, you get an on site audit. Uh, with several experts, usually, you know, maybe two or three people where you have a forest economist, a civil culturist, you know, a few different fields there. Um, and those people are often working on a consulting basis. They may be a university professor, someone who works for industry, or nowadays there are whole companies that, you know, are designed where they kind of do this on a consulting basis. So, um, so once you get certified, you need a surveillance audit every 12 months, full recertification every three years. Um, so before those surveillance audits, you know, you'll hear the people working at the companies and we'll be, you know, contact them. Hey, can you come give a guest presentation a class? And they're like, now we got our surveillance audit coming up. So we're out picking up trash. And so they do all this stuff just to make the property look as best as they can. Um, and then they work with the auditors and the auditors will pick stands they want to go see at random. And then they'll go out and they'll visit them. At least that's what they were doing before COVID. Um, and then the results of that audit, um, best case scenario, yes, you meet standards, boom, you get your certificate, your SFI certified, you're good to go. You may have a major nonconformity. Uh, they figure out that you have just been logging right down to the streams and not leaving SMZs. That's going to be a big deal, right? And so they're not going to issue a certificate until they go back out there and see that you have actually taken an action and fixed that problem. Um, so it's actually been implemented. So that, that would be a big deal. Minor nonconformity may be something where, you know, what you're doing on the ground is okay, but you may not be, you know, doing the paperwork right on it. You're not keeping the right records, something like that. And so you show them that you have a plan to fix this. They issue you the certificate. And when they do that 12 month surveillance audit, they check and make sure that you have uh, followed through with the plan as you said you would. Um, and they publish all these audit reports online for the sake of transparency. So there's a lot of focus with SFI on transparency. Um, they were uh, originally, they came out of the American Pulp and Paper Association. So, you know, from some environmental groups, there's skepticism about, you know, are they really, you know, really checking and making sure these people are doing the right thing when they came out of a trade group that represents the mills, right? Um, but, you know, they, they've taken a lot of efforts to be as transparent as possible, clear in what they're requiring. And so um, they pretty substantial organization by this point with a good reputation. Here's how SFI is organized. Um, they have broad principles nested within those are objectives nested within those are performance measures and nested within those are indicators. And so here are their 14 principles. And so uh, I think this was as of like 2014, they may have more these days, who knows? Um, but you can see these are really, really broad. We wanna practice sustainable forestry, right? So if I was an auditor and I came out to your property, how do I make sure you're doing that? That's really nebulous, right? So that's just a broad principle. Within that, they have 20 objectives within their 14 principles. And so the objectives are kind of broken up where from a civil cultural standpoint, we really are focused on Objectives one through seven, that's the forest land management. Objectives eight through 13, that's the fiber sourcing. So that's the mill side objectives. If you're working as a procurement forester, 
That may be what you're focused on. And then uh, forest land management and fiber sourcing, both of them for objectives 14 through 20. Those are the broader objectives like uh, outreach and education, uh, research, so they're broader objectives. Here's objective one of 20, to broaden implementation of sustainable forestry by ensuring long-term harvest levels based on the use of best scientific information available. So you can see that's a little more specific. If you're out on someone's property trying to make sure they're managing forest sustainably, you know, you're getting closer to something you can check. But again, that would be open to a lot of interpretation, right? So here within objective one is performance measure 1.1. Program participants shall ensure that forest management plans include long-term harvest levels that are sustainable and consistent with appropriate growth and yield models. So now we're getting closer. Now, as I audit your company, I can say, okay, show me your management plan. So now we know we're looking for a management plan. What growth and yield model are you using? Let's look at the projections. So these are all things you'll be doing in management plans. You know, you'll be creating a management plan. You'll be using growth and yield models. You'll be including long-term harvest levels. So you all are going to do this when you get to Dr. Kidd's class. Still a little wiggle room there. So then nested within performance measure 1.1 is indicator one. And so now this is getting closer to a checklist. So forest management planning at a level appropriate to the size and scale of the operation. If you're a small company that has a mill and a thousand acres of land that you own, you know, they're not going to expect you to have all the bells and whistles. Uh, but if you're a company like Warehouser that has 13 million acres, they expect you to have a pretty good GIS system, pretty significant capabilities, right? So this allows the auditors to scale what they're looking for to the scale of the operation. So now they're looking for a long-term resource analysis, forest inventory, a land classification system, soil inventory, soil maps, growth and yield modeling capabilities, uh, up-to-date maps, or a good GIS system, recommended sustainable harvest levels, and then a review of non-timber issues. So these are specific things they can look for in a management plan. If you're trying to get SFI certified, yeah, now you know what they're gonna be looking for and you can put together your plans in such a way that you would meet certification, so. And so these audits take two to four days because there are 14 principles, 20 objectives, within all those are 38 performance measures and there are 115 of those indicators. And keep in mind, this was just one of the 115 so some of the indicators have pretty long lists associated with them as well. So that's why the audits are taking so long. Okay, so we've looked at indicator, one of the indicators. So let's just get through the other 114 um, and then, then we can move along. No. We'll, we'll just look at a few of them that are actually gonna impact prescription writing. So um, one of their indicators basically says, you know, follow BMPs, uh, but they get a little specific in there. So. Um, they want contract provisions to make sure your loggers are following BMPs. Um, this might include a wet weather shutdown clause, where if it gets too wet, the logging has to cease so that they don't run up your site, which can cause a lot of erosion, which can get that sediment into the streams. You need a monitoring program for BMP implementation. So show that you're going out after harvest operations, you're inspecting them where there are problems, you're working with the loggers to resolve those problems. Um, implement forest management practices to protect soil and maintain forest productivity. That's pretty similar to not putting the sediment in your streams, right? Anytime the sediment's not in your streams, it's on your site, it's growing your trees. So again, that fits right in with BMPs. This one causes a little bit of confusion some semesters in management plans. Um, the average size of clear cut harvest areas should not exceed 120 acres. This does not mean that no one clear cut can go over 120 acres. This means that within that certified tree farm, your average for a year can't exceed 120 acres. So you can go put in a 240 acre clear cut. And then if you put in three 20 acre clear cuts, your average is below 120, it's okay. So it's just an average clear cut size. It's not the size of any one clear cut. Now they're gonna look at you kind of weird if you put in a 5,000 acre clear cut and then a bunch of 10 acre clear cuts, right? That could cause issues. So, you know, the people auditing you aren't stupid. So, you know, make sure you're, you know, getting lower on that number. But, and the intent here is just to avoid really big clear cuts, make for a patchier landscape. There's a lot of data out there that basically shows this has been effective at improving wildlife habitat quality, putting less sediment into streams. And so, you know, it's been relatively successful. Here's the other thing, the whole bottom half of that I didn't read. 
If you have southern pine beetle that goes and hits 2,000 acres, you can salvage log that. If you have a fire that hits 10,000 acres, you can salvage log that. That wasn't a clear cut that you were planning. That was a natural disturbance or a forest health emergency. Um, and so you, you can go respond to that. That's not gonna kill your average. Okay, um, basically the next couple of these are just to keep people from getting around uh, that clear cut rule. And so basically you can't just, you know, put clear cuts right beside each other and you can't just, you know, have all these clear cuts and not regenerate them. So basically you need to get your reforestation done in a reasonable time, planting within two years, natural regeneration within five years. And these things aren't unreasonable. The landowners are going to want to do that anyway, right? You don't want to leave your land there fallow. You want to be, you know, growing your next rotation on it. And then here's the idea where you can't just say, I'm putting in 120 acre clear cuts and we have four of them that are side by side this year. Um, they can't be adjacent because you can't clear cut next to a previous clear cut until your harvest areas are at least three years old or the trees are at least five feet tall. So, so that just avoids the aesthetic impact of having one big clear cut. Okay, you need to be able to judge what adequate regeneration is and correct understocked areas to achieve acceptable species composition. What tool have we used in lab that might be helpful towards that end? Baker Broadfoot will give you a site index estimate for species now. So you're trying to judge adequate regeneration. How could you document this for SFI? Yeah, do a regen survey, right? The regen survey will let you know you're successful. So stock quadrat, belidal, you know, come up with a regen survey method that works. Uh, minimize planting of exotic tree species. We're not doing this anyway in the South, so not a huge deal, right? Um, but you know, if you are gonna do them, make sure you show that they're not gonna cause a risk towards invasion. So when Mead West Faco was planting eucalyptus, they had pretty good documentation that it was unlikely to become invasive in the US South. Um, if you're doing a seed tree or shelter wood, retain vigorous overstory trees. You know, that's going to be the parents for the next generation. Again, that's, that's best practice anyway. You're going to be wanting to do that anyway if you're doing a shelter wood or a seed tree. Um, have a program to address visual quality management. So are you going to be leaving aesthetic management zones? What are you going to be doing to address visual quality? Minimize chemical use. And if you follow herbicides by label, you're probably gonna be doing that anyway, right? So there's an example of a spot application in New Zealand on radiotopine. Not that that could be SFI certified because it's not in North America, but. So you can see a lot of this is basic stuff you'd be doing silviculturally anyway that we've already gone over. Okay, so any questions on SFI? Okay, next up is tree farm. It's actually the oldest certification system. FSC and SFI came about in the mid 1990s, uh, you know, 50 years after tree farm had already started in 1941. Um, the data there is recent. So there's about 74,000 tree farms, 20.5 million acres in the US. And in Texas, you apply through the Texas Forestry Association and they'll even pay your $100 application fees. So this is free for the landowner. Um, usually a TFS, Texas Forest Service Forester will come out, help you put a management plan together, help you with the application, um, and then you can get your, your tree farm certified. Consulting foresters can also help landowners with this as well. Um, tree farm has been a really, really popular program. Landowners like it. They, you know, you like putting that sign up. Um, it shows that you're doing a good job managing your land. Um, we heard from the Foshi family, you know, that pride in, in the land, pride in how they're managing the land. So I think a lot of folks that own forest land have that same ethic, so. Um, so to be tree farm certified, it's, you've got an acreage from 10 to 10,000 acres. Um, it's going to be privately held, not publicly traded. Um, we have seen other instances where luminant, where they're reclaiming their uh, surface mine lands. They've gotten that tree farm certified. So it's, you know, it's not a company like Warehouse or a forest timber company that's doing this, but you know, we could get our ST microelectronics properties that the school is managing. We could get those tree farms certified. Um, so it could be a local business, a government, you know, anything like that. The majority of it is non-industrial private forest landowners, however. You have to clearly exhibit commitment to sustainable management. So you have to have a management plan, basically. So the intent of tree farm is not to create this really high unattainable bar or a lot of uh, red tape for the landowners. It's almost intended as an education program to help get more information out there to landowners on what good forestry looks like. 
And so the management plan is, is relatively basic. And again, um, your local district TFS Forester, Sam McCaleb up here in Nagadocious, uh, can go out to your property, help you put that together, uh, help you get tree farm certified, or you can work with a consulting forester um, and they can help you with this as well. So, so that's tree farm. Uh, next up we have EQUIP, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program. Uh, this is a good thing to be aware of, especially if you end up working around here. This is administered through the Natural Resource Conservation Service, the NRCS. And basically it's a federal subsidy. And so you're getting federal money to help pay uh, for some management action you're doing. A lot of it goes to agriculture. Um, here in Nagadoshes County, a fair bit of it goes to forestry as well. But basically the federal government is trying to incentivize agriculture and forest management. That's why this program exists. And so it was reauthorized in the last uh, farm bill um, and it can be pretty substantial. So, you know, if you have enough acreage, you can get up to $300,000 over six years. Um, that'll vary state to state, county to county. Um, but in Nagadoshes County, there's some of the different operations that they will help you pay for. And so it, it can be a significant cost savings to the landowner. Um, if you're a consultant and you're working with landowners who want to use Equip, you have to be aware of a few things. Plan well in advance. Um, NRCS will get a lot of applications for this program. They'll only process them a certain number of times a year to divvy out the money as they receive the money from the treasury. Um, and so it's not that, oh, we want to plant next month. Let's get Equip funds to do it. It's not going to work that way. So you need to be planning a year or two ahead of time uh, to get in the queue to have the potential for this funding. Um, and then they, they may have uh, prescription requirements. They may have you planting at a certain density. They may have you windrowing the stand first. They may have you doing some things you wouldn't ideally do, but uh, maybe worth doing to, to get this additional funding. Of course, it's up to the landowner. You know, some landowners are going to view this as like a handout and they're not going to want to go anywhere near it. Other landowners are going to think this is a great opportunity. That's their tax dollars at work. So um, you know, it's up to the landowners, whatever their politics are, but this is an option out there that many landowners already interested in. So any questions on Equip?